Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Literacy View. We have a very special guest with us today. We actually just met him from Twitter. And uh, we are so pleased to have on Trevor Alio. Am I saying that right? You got it. Nailed okay. it. Okay. And Trevor teaches high school English, designs professional learning experiences for teachers, and researches the intersection of critical, digital, and disciplinary literacies. He is the co-author of Learning That Transfers, Designing Curriculum for a Changing World, and a doctoral student at the University of Illinois. And we saw that Trevor posted something very interesting. I'm going to read the quote that we saw. And it says, and this was um, a response when Emily Hanford posted a book list. She has a recommended book list out there. And Trevor posted, considering a key theme of soul to story is the danger of following edu gurus. I find it very interesting that a lot of the SOR crowd all seem to cite the same handful of folks, some of whom have very little expertise in the stuff they're writing trade books about. And Judy, my co-host Judy Boxner, ended up texting me saying, did you see this tweet? Did you see what this guy Trevor wrote? And so I looked at it and we we're both like, wow, that's a really interesting conversation. So Trevor, what made you decide to post this on Twitter? We want to hear your thoughts. I find it very interesting. Judy found it interesting. And when we put it in our um, Facebook group, we have a Facebook group for the Literacy View. We got a lot of comments about it. Some in favor of what you said, and some thought that um, they they weren't happy with you, Trevor. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, interesting. I wish I would have seen those replies. The tweet didn't get that much traction, but um, but no. So uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I guess part of the reason why I posted it is, like everyone else, I am a victim of the Twitter algorithm. Um, you know, it seems to bring out hot takes in folks. It's kind of programmed to do that. Um, but uh, as somebody who is very passionate about creating intersections between research, particularly dealing with literacy and classroom practice, um, sometimes I get uh, a bee in my bonnet uh, seeing and knowing so many fantastic uh, literacy researchers who are doing incredible work um, and do, you know, to the best of their ability, try to reach out to practitioners in the classroom, um, but, you know, struggle to get traction. Um, and then there are other people whose ideas and voices are, you know, in many instances valid um, and they're bringing, you know, perspectives to the table or, or research to the table that like should be examined. But um, the it seems that oftentimes those people who are sort of positioned as gurus take up a lot of space in terms of not only the discourse on Twitter, because, you know, that's whatever, but um, that then bleeds into the realm of policy and pedagogy in the classroom. Um, and, you know, again, I think it's important to have as many voices in this conversation as possible. But oftentimes I feel like the gurus are crowding out the people who are either A, in the classroom doing the work or B, uh, you know, in academia doing research and, you know, having the ideas that they share getting peer reviewed by their peers and, and sort of legitimized through those processes of, of academic research. Judy, I, I think I have to start with a cheers button. After Trevor just <laughs> Faith, Faith, I haven't seen you smile that much in an intro portion <laughs> of the literacy view in a while. And you never know what you're going to get with Faith. It could be smiles, <laughs> it could be a concerned look. She has no poker face. So Trevor, you're I'll in be watching today. now to make sure. <laughs> for Faith to get the, wait, we've only been on the air for about two minutes. For Faith to take out the cheers button in two minutes, that's a good sign. I'll do it too. Uh, I just, <laughs> thanks. That's good. Good stuff. I have to tell you, Trevor, um, you just said in two minutes, 
what Judy and I had been saying to each other privately and publicly for a while now. Um, which book on that book list was concerning? Was there more than one? Um, you know, I, I think we're both interested to know what your thoughts are. Um, for me, it's less individual books and more the fact that, and this, this is a tension that I want to, I want to kind of honor books that are accessible to a wide variety of folks, which is really important, but the people who are able to publish and promote and market those books oftentimes aren't the people in the field doing the research. Um, so I think that just generally, those are the sort of books that are promoted and shared most widely. I do want to put a shout out to Marianne Wolf's research. Um, I have really enjoyed Proust and the Squid and Reader Come Home. Um, and I, I kind of boxed around her for, for, for my claim. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want this to be, again, like a, a personal sort of internet of beefs thing um, that I feel like oftentimes happens in these literacy um, spaces and conversations. So I, it's not really as much about um, individual ideas, um, or sorry, individual people or books as much as it, as it is like the structure of the way that ideas are taken up, shared, or promoted. Um, is that too much of a dodge? <laughs> no, no. And I think it's a well thought out, intelligent answer. Judy, um, you and I have talked about this and we just had an episode on recently uh, where we had three researchers and all of whom are very interested in making sure that this work reaches teachers in a practical way. What are some of your thoughts that you have uh, on Trevor's tweet and his comments? All right, so first of all, I want to honor you again, Faith. You know why? We just had a presidential debate last night, and I actually think Faith's questions are better than anybody's. I love you, Faith. You are a badass, Faith. You ask the hard questions. Trevor, good job answering. I don't think you dodged the question. You know, I think that was a smart response. And uh, similarly to you, I definitely don't like to, like, highlight certain individuals that much because th that could be really uncomfortable. But my honest opinion, Trevor, was that you were very brave because what you wrote down is what goes through my mind very often. And I think like, and I'm going to say a name, when people see a name like Emily, like the whole world, we are so happy that she exposed a tremendous problem. But at the end of the day, Emily's just a person too, right? That doesn't mean that everything that Emily or Judy or Trevor, or Faith, or Tim Rosinski, or Marianne Wolf, that everything that we say is perfect and the word of, you know, what is it? The Bible or like the literacy Bible. That, that doesn't mean that we should just blankly say, okay, this person said it, that's it. I'm going to like, this is going to be my everything. I think that, you know, the literacy view has been a big part of, you know, honoring people in the literacy world, but, but primarily focusing on what does the research say? And very often the research may say things that many people are uncomfortable with. It may be very different than um, what we've been doing in the classroom for a very long time. And I think the danger with just following people rather than the research is extremely problematic. And I'll give an example with the whole knowledge building mode. A movement. For a while, there was this whole discussion online that knowledge building alone is going to fix a very big piece of the literacy crisis. And yes, I truly believe in my heart of hearts, knowledge building is extremely important. However, I think that campaign initially neglected a very important part of the research, which says that strategy instruction is equally as important because not every kid is gonna come in with the same amount of knowledge. No matter what program or what curriculum or what experiences they have, there's definitely no way that everybody's gonna be on an equal playing field. How do we 
level that playing field by giving kids knowledge, but also giving them strategies to problem solve reading passages or writing. And two of the greatest um, learning journeys that I've been on recently because of the whole strategy research is Think SRSD. I want to give a gigantic shout out to Leslie Wood because of all the learning that I've gained and that I'm implementing and that I'm excited about because of the learning that she's given me. And I also want to give a big, tremendous shout out to the team at um, Texas A&M University, as well as the University of Tennessee, where Marianne Rice is, Kay, Casey, brilliant people that are literally shaking up my entire life in terms of my comprehension knowledge. I am learning so much about that piece of the literacy rope. For a long time, I was so hyper-focused on the foundational skills and teaching kids how to crack the code that I myself was guilty of not immersing myself in the latest research and science on what it means to teach kids how to understand. So I really feel thankful for what you said. We lost a couple of viewers on our, or group members in our Facebook group, but to those that left, you're welcome to come back. And if we're not the right place for you, there's other podcasts to listen to, no hard feelings. But if we can't feel safe to tell our honest beliefs and we can't have civil discourse where we agree and disagree, then we're not going to get very far. Yeah. So, Trevor, Judy said a couple of things that I want to talk about. So this idea that, um, you know, we we have a problem just having a conversation about what is evidence-based and what might just be something where we play telephone and now all of a sudden it's taken on its own life where we think it has this SOR label. Um, are there any examples of that? You're an English teacher um, and you're studying this space between research and practice. Are there any practices now that have this label of SOR, at least um, to your understanding, which in fact, we don't really have evidence. Do you know of any of that? Hmm. Well, I think um, you were speaking of uh, Leslie Lauder, Laud earlier, and she just posted a really interesting article talking about the baseball study. Um, and the baseball study is sort of seen as a seminal piece of research supporting the importance of prior knowledge. And I want to be clear, I think that it's important to have knowledge building approaches in a repertoire. However, the question that was raised, and forgive me for getting too philosophical, um, in the article was, well, what is knowledge? Is knowledge a collection of facts about baseball? Is knowledge an understanding of the way that people who are baseball fans speak about baseball, what players they know, and what terms they know that aren't maybe in like a factoid checklist of baseball, but are things like insider knowledge, right? So my research is in disciplinary literacy. So a lot of the times when I'm thinking about knowledge, I'm not just thinking about like as an English teacher, or if I want my students to be little proto-literary scholars, them having knowledge of a huge book list, but knowing what types of claims or questions um, or uh, compositions literary scholars do, right? So that's knowledge that isn't just a collection of facts, it's textured by whatever culture or community that those people are in. So the issue with the baseball study isn't that it gets people to think about how kids need to know stuff before they read, that's really important. The problem is it really shrinks our perspective about like what knowledge is, right? So what I get concerned with is teachers giving kids a bunch of facts about bumblebees before they read an article about bumblebees right and don't get me wrong bumblebees are important right i think i think i don't think they're endangered anymore um but you know that's not to say that it's not good for them to build knowledge about bumblebees but um the the trade book that i wrote is on transfer right and if you are only focusing on bumblebees right that is just one tiny little node in the vast network of knowledge that kids need to know and you're just hoping that whatever articles they encounter in the future are dealing with bumblebees, right? And of course, there's an accumulation effect, et cetera, et cetera. But, right, what about like conceptual knowledge, the relationship between flora and fauna? That's like kind of a bigger 
category of conceptual knowledge. But the conversations about knowledge building don't go there. They sort of stop at, we need to help kids learn more about a collection of topics, right? So um, that's not necessarily an example of how like what is labeled as SOR is wrong, but a lot of times what is considered having that SOR label is a very narrow slice of a much broader field of research that people aren't aware of. And sometimes people could like, you know, me saying this, people might be like, oh, he's anti-knowledge. I'm not. I, I am saying that there is use for that stuff that came from the baseball study, but there's more to understand. And, and Judy, what I appreciate about your response is you there is a curiosity, right? You don't want to be right. You want to know more. And I think that that is the problem I have with the sort of guru discourse space is people are like, I'm on the right team instead of this person is pointing me to interesting ideas. And if we could have more pursuing of interesting ideas, unless I'm on the right team, therefore I am right, then I think the we'd be in a better space with how we deal with literacy research in the public domain. Well, I see Judy is holding up that shares button as well. I, yeah, you're, you're really- Listen, um, you, you know, you never know what you're gonna get. Sometimes, you know, we know <laughs> the guest really well. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we take a gamble and we took a gamble on you. We didn't know you that well and we didn't know what to expect. But based on Faith's smile, which has not left the screen for about 16 and 28 minutes. You're doing pretty well, Trevor. She's really liking what you have to say. And you know what I like about you, Trevor? You're a straight shooter. I really appreciate that you don't seem to be thinking, oh, what is this person going to think? What You're just speaking your truth. And I think that's what we have to be more comfortable doing in this space. You know, we have to stop worrying about who we're going to piss off or who's not going to agree with us, because the only way we're really going to shift that needle and help move student outcomes is if we ask those tough questions, if we really think deeper about these things. So kudos to Trevor, kudos to Faith. Keep it going, guys. So, I'm going to take a, a seltzer. <laughs> so Trevor, you're going to be very excited. We are having the author, one of the authors, on the literacy view of the baseball study. So oh, excellent. Yes. So that is Judy. Judy, you're me, you're not talking right now. <laughs> Faith, but all the other viewers are going to know, and all the other podcasters are going to. That's okay. See them right That's okay because they can't duplicate these conversations. That's for sure. But um, we will be having uh, Dan on one of the authors. We. Uh, spoke to Courtney. She can't make it, but Dan is going to join us. So I hope you listen to that. Uh, I thought that Absolutely. was a fascinating, fascinating study as well. And um, I was all over that. And I said to Judy, we have to get in contact with these authors and we are going to have them on. Well, like I said, one of them, but so I'm glad you brought that up. So let's shift gears a little bit about programs. Now, you're a high school teacher. I don't know if this is as relevant to the work that you do, but there has been also a lot of conversations about evidence-based programs. Um, generally, these are programs that are used at the elementary school level. All right. But it's the same idea where um, they're billed as SOR, right? This is SOR. All these school districts are looking to get these programs in. But really, there are evidence-based practices, but we really don't have the evidence for the program. And so now that you're kind of studying this space, what are some of your thoughts about that when um, programs, we'll talk about the evidence behind it, but we haven't really tested this out in a classroom no. and we don't have any research long-term that shows if it works, it doesn't work. Yet we know that if you look at some of the practices in the program, yes, there's evidence for that. What are some of your thoughts as somebody who's in that research space as well as the teaching space? Yeah, no, that's a, a, a like fantastic question. And I think that this is something that is true. 
and I don't want to like create like a, a divide of teachers. I think it, it's a lot more complicated than this, but but there are folks who are really in the camp of you know a certain workshop model that will go unnamed. And then there are folks who are now in this SOR camp. And again, it's a lot more complicated than that, but if I were to reduce it, you could say that. And my issue with both of those is that they are about programs, right? It is the purchase of curriculum as though it is a commodity that you consume and then the curriculum does the teaching, right? And of course, like I'm sure there's PD around it, um, but having been at a school, um, I did two years in middle school um, during the pandemic. It was a fun time to be a middle school teacher. Um, and the school that I was at had a program that I found absolutely suffocating um, because there were things that I knew were best practices that were in the research and things that would help you know, honor my students that I felt like I wasn't really allowed to bring in because they didn't fit the parameters of the box. Right. So regardless of the content of the boxes, I think that both sets of boxes have some worthwhile practices that we should consider using. The problem is when we treat curriculum like it is something that you that you purchase, you post and then, you know, teachers become these curricular technicians where they don't know how the car works as a whole unit, but they know how, you know, one uh, syst one like sort of sy subsystem works and they just fiddle around in the margins. Right. I think ideally we would teach our have teachers become like curricular mechanics, right? Where they have the autonomy to take and build, um, you know, their own sort of model pulling from research-based practices. Um, so I think that we would be a lot better off if we invested in people instead of of programs and finding research, you know, and across across a range of the different teams, if you will, within the the literacy you know, discourse, um, but bringing that together. Um, and I'm, I'm like, a, I'm a pedagogical pluralist. Like I, I think about, and I read cognitive science. I look at research and critical literacies. I look at research from sociocultural perspectives of learning. And for me, I'm pulling from that repertoire whenever I make choices in my classroom or whenever I'm figuring out, you know, what sort of theory should inform my research. Um, but that's a really long way to say, um, people and pedagogy over programs, right? And programs can support people in pedagogy, but if they replace them, then like we're out of a job and AI can can do that. AI can implement a program, right? Because it's just about taking ideas and delivering them to students instead of them being filtered through a, a person, right? And the relationships um, that form when you teach. As we talk about, yeah, as we talk about, um, this idea of edu gurus. I'm embarrassed to say, Trevor, you're my guru. <laughs> I just love, I know, I know, I love everything you are saying, and Judy's mouth is wide open. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, I'm loving what you're saying. So I have a quote here from one of our no BS besties, Robert Pondicio. Are you familiar with Robert? I am. Okay. So we've had Robert on a couple of times, and here's a tweet that he put out. He said, at present, there are too many of my fellow curriculum advocates who believe or allow the belief to persist unchecked that the program is the difference maker. The culture of teaching around implementation has to change. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, I would say that in, in many conversations, I would probably be uh, you know, aligned to a different perspective um, than, than Robert. But in this instance, I am in total agreement. Um, I do think, because it's just easier, right? It's easier and cleaner to be like, the problem is this program. Look, we put it into a book, just take it and implement it. And I think that, you know, all of us are, you know, many teachers are struggling, you know, obviously we're in a kind of a post COVID moment for the most part, but like teachers are tired and administrators are tired. And it's a lot easier to be like, we found the answer. We bought it online. Here it is in a book, right? But, but to his point and to his credit, he's pointing out that, um, the people offering up that as a solution, um, to my mind, are kind of warping what curriculum can be, right? In some spaces, like curriculum can seem like a word when people hear it, they automatically think box, right? And I think that, no, you can have a curriculum 
Um, some of the best PD I had was designing the uh, when I taught in a large public school in um, Northern Virginia. And the best PD I ever had was working with other English teachers in the district to come together and build sort of our curriculum framework that was offered. And it was like a take it if you need it, but you don't have to. Um, and that curricular work enriched me as a teacher far more than anything that I could get from a program. Um, and I think that teachers are missing out on that because of the dynamics that that um, Robert's pointing out, that that there's this emphasis on you know curriculum as a solution, um, but the curriculum that's being offered is like not being filtered through people. It's being filtered through programs. So Judy, we had our no BS bestie, Maureen Ruby on. And Maureen talked about the difference between program and curriculum. And what Trevor is talking about, at least it sounds, okay, thumbs up. He's, he's giving me a thumbs up. What Trevor is talking about is curriculum, right? And putting your emphasis into everybody, all the players, understanding what should be taught and the program is the tool. Once again, the program is the tool. It's not the whole package. So Judy, any thoughts about that? Well, I think Maureen definitely helped the whole educational community uh, sort through that because I think a lot of people knew that and some people didn't know that. And I think the conversation from what I'm seeing in the field, people are starting to understand that. I think the problem is, though, it's going to take people time to develop a solid curriculum and to figure out what's working and what's not working. And I think the roadblock um, is that, you know, the F-bomb in education is thrown out all the time, that fidelity F-bomb. So, you know, principals will say fidelity, fidelity, fidelity to the program. However, we know that not everything in the program is aligned to the research, is aligned to the evidence. Like for instance, I just learned that reviewing the gist is a critical thing that we should be doing every day. So why am I not going to incorporate that into my lessons? So I think that we have to be able to shift and I think we have to be able to prioritize, you know, pedagogy and people and training. But I think there's also something very interesting, right? Implementation science is something we have to think about. What does implementation look like at each individual site? Is it going the same way? What does the rollout look like? What support are the teachers getting? I think that we also need to look at the data. A lot of schools implemented programs with fidelity and the data dropped. The data dropped. Faith, what do you think of the drops in the data? If you're talking about in New York City, just to clarify, um, they were given a choice of three different programs. And um, this was tracked over the year, Trevor. And what it showed, at least from what we read, was that um, these uh, upper grades actually fell. You know, they dropped which of course, first year of implementation, it's not easy. So in all fairness, we, we have to allow for some time to adjust, but it is kind of uh, raising some questions for us to think about, were these teachers given enough training? Did anybody go through the program with them to see what should be pulled out and what's really important to do? Because um, as Robert Pondicio said, another tweet, he kind of described it as we, we shouldn't treat curriculum as this scrapyard and where we throw everything in. Some of it could be junk. Who knows? Um, nobody's really helping these teachers sort through this. Can I say something controversial, Faith? Yeah, sure. All right. So I think we had Nate Joseph on recently that said that there's a high effect size for having coaches in buildings supporting teachers. And guess what happened in New York City? 
a lot of us coaches were told that the team is being dismantled. And luckily, I'm safe. Somebody hired me in-house, so now I'm a coach in-house. But many schools didn't have the same level of support. You know, they still get support at the district level. But when you take away support, does that play a factor in rolling out an implementation? You know, maybe teachers need a cheerleader in their corner every day, helping them co-teach those lessons, model those lessons, understand the science of reading at a deeper level. So, you know, I think that the people high up, whether it be in New York City, Connecticut, Australia, New Zealand, think about what matters. You know, don't just give lip service and say, we're going to change programs and a miracle is going to happen because that's not the way it works. So, Trevor, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the research that you are interested in now? Because before we started to record, you you started to tell us some of um, your interests and what uh, you'd like to do. Um, are any of the things that we're talking about things that you are following um, in your studies at the moment that maybe you could shed some light for us? Um, yeah, so not specifically. Um, I'll be able to draw a through line, but I want to respond to something that Judy was saying too. Um, there is a book that I love um, and uh, a friend who I've had some conversations with thinking about implementation science. Um, his name is Dr. Brad Kirshner, and he wrote a book called Understanding Educational Complexity. And it's a very complex book. And my biggest takeaway from it was like, obviously it's kind of glib and obvious to say, you know, it's complicated to implement research and schools are complicated, dynamic ecosystems. But like reading his book, it's like, oh my God, the number of, of things that this man brought up that teachers and educators and researchers and administrators need to consider just on a daily basis, the micro decisions, um, the personality, the culture, in addition to the research and implementation is just like so, oh, sorry. Last. Sorry, I, I'll have to cut us off shortly. Um, but um, it is all feeds into the decision making that educators have to do. And it is just so wildly complex that taking any program or research, no matter how, what the effect size is, what like the empirical research says, and putting it into the messiness of context is always going to distort what happens. That's not to say that like research isn't important and it, it doesn't point out like trends and patterns with generalizability, but the big takeaway from my research that I'm doing, and I, my study is way more qualitative, um, but I'm realizing how many things it would be dangerous for me to say because X number of students knew or did thing Y, um, that means Z population will be able to do the exact same thing. And it's, we have to be really careful with how we parse that. Well, Trevor is um, a young dad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. And you know what? I get it. Right? You you were kind enough to come on with us. And you have a life too. And it's yeah. the evening. And we so much appreciate having you on. And, um, you know, I think this is a conversation that needs to be talked about some more. And I do want to reiterate the idea how dangerous it is to go in that direction of having these um, edu celebrities, the you know, and just idolizing people and not really looking at what they're saying just because it's a certain personality. And we're used to seeing a certain person in this space. And we trust that everything that this person might say is um, accurate. Awesome. Thank you so, so Trevor, much. Again, I'm yeah, so Trevor, I'm so sorry. But it was great chatting with you both. Faith, stay on. We'll keep recording for a couple of minutes. Okay. You thank you, Trevor. Just start. Yep. Bye, Trevor. Wow. That was a really interesting, interesting conversation. Judy, what are some of your thoughts? Now that Trevor's not here, but um, you know, I think that he kicked off a conversation that we've been having for a while. 
that I definitely think your book should have been on the list. I'm not going to lie, Faith. And it's not just because I love you. And I actually don't idolize you. I love you. But even you and I, we disagree. But I think that your book should have definitely been on the list because that book was written way before Soul the Story even hit the market. Faith, Faith was on the money with that story. But I think that this was a fabulous episode. I hope that, you know, people do their research. Faith, what tips can you give people like me that are, and you're still in the trenches, what does the average person do to figure out and sort through this mess? How do I figure out, is this book worth reading? Is this book not worth reading? Is this person that wrote this book qualified to write this book or am I wasting my time? What would be Faith's words, words of wisdoms for next steps for people in the field? No, that's a really good question because there are books out there that, you know, are worth reading. They certainly are worth reading, but that doesn't mean that we could say they are, you know, aligned with research. Um, maybe pieces of it are. So we have to really go in with a discerning eye and you can get certain um, tips that could be helpful as a teacher. So it's not to say that some of these trade books are not worthwhile, but they're being promoted as if they are. And I think that's problematic. Some of these books um, out there, people are looking at as if, if they follow the book, then that means they're going to um, get the results that they desire, that scores will go up. And that's not necessarily the case. What, what you liked and what I liked in this recent discussion that we had with the Texas A&M people, um, Kay, Casey, and Marianne, um, was that they didn't just put out a piece of research and just you know walk away from it. They actually tracked schools, multiple schools, and continued to talk to the teachers and make sure that everything was implemented well. And you can't get access to their work unless you do the professional development. And then you're able to get all the materials and then they give you a way to stay in contact with them. Leslie, same thing. So, uh, you know, she followed the research of SRSD, of Karen Harris, and she put together a professional development program that shows continuous support. And I put out um, a tweet or a post just today about that, about the importance of continuous support, that everything begins and ends with continuous support. So in answer to your question, I don't think it's... Um, you know, an easy answer, Judy, but I think that teachers have to realize that one book or one program is not going to give you exactly what you think just because it might go under this SOR banner, that it takes a lot more than just, you know, a slice of research. As Trevor said, there needs to be context. And there needs to be people who are out there supporting teachers along the way, not just a one and done, but continuous support. And unfortunately, a lot of the people out there are giving um, the impression that they have all the answers and people look to them and as if they, um, you know, they, they have all the answers that teachers need, and they don't. That makes a lot of sense, Faith. And I think that, you know, if there's one thing we should have learned from, you know, sold a story is, you know, the obsession the whole world had with Teachers College, with Lucy Calkins, with Fontes and Pinnell. Like we were, it was almost like that was God. 
these are just people. They're just people. They're, you know, we cannot idolize people. And, you know, Faith and I were talking about it the other day. And, you know, we talked about TC. And, you know, a lot of people got caught up in all of the flashiness. It was an Ivy League college. But then I'm like, Faith, did they have a research department that was working with, you know, Lucy? Was there Faith? Was there? Well, you know, when all the research came out, how did Lucy not know about the most up-to-date research? It's kind of, I know, drink up. I don't have my coffee or my tea tonight. But 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 but, but look like look at Texas A&M University, look at Marion Rice, look at uh, Iowa. They seem to have researchers at the universities that are helping actually bridge that research to uh, application, right? Was that happening there in, in, in the truest sense or was it just PD with fluff and no substance? So I think that's an important piece, but I think that that's really the key. And, you know, it brings me back to something Wiley Blevins said, don't be a critic from the couch. Do not be a critic from the couch. If you're producing research, don't just write that research and expect that us teachers in the field are going to understand what that means for us in the classrooms. You know, take that extra time to explain it in a way. And when we invite you for a conversation, don't just ignore us. You know, don't just put out the stuff and make it like a riddle. Research should not be a riddle. Because you know what? The kids in the field are counting on us and they don't have three weeks to wait till you decide it's time to speak up and put out another riddle. So cut it out, people. And thank you to all the researchers out there that are collaborating. Thank you for making the Literacy View the number one place where researchers come to to break their news with us. And I think with that, we're going to wrap things up. Follow us on theliteracyview.com. Follow us on our Facebook group. We're growing by the minute. We lost one viewer that didn't like Trevor's post, but you know what? We gained about 50 or 60 more right after that. So join our Facebook group, share our posts. Now you can advertise with the Literacy View. Go to theliteracyview.com. We'll put your little uh, advertisements in our reels. And uh, we're changing lives one view at a time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And like we said before, we have so many good episodes coming up. Um, you know, this one was the kickoff with the uh, Texas A&M Literacy I.O. people. But we really have some lineup and we have some very special surprises in store. So Judy and I are not ready to break the news but it's coming. There's something very exciting on the horizon. So stay with us and you'll find out. Okay. Bye everyone.